So if we're ready, are we ready, Bob? Okay. Here we go. Thank you all for uh, showing up here today. This is uh, uh, the Camino Revisited. Um, I guess I don't get that in the back. So uh, that's all right. We're having a little bit of trouble with our monitors. But um, uh, this is uh, just the story of my journey on the Camino. And so we're looking for a way to summarize a lot of it. I, I do feel like there are so many facets um, to it that I want to offer as much as I can, uh, but not be comprehensive. I also feel the great um, pressure of any time, I feel like uh, when you do family slides or, you know, this is our vacation, and here's another picture. I, I don't want to overstay uh, my welcome here, but I want to give you enough of a taste, and I think there's enough here. Um, so with that, let me offer a prayer, and we'll dive in. Lord, thank you for the way that you've called us to be your people, and and for some, Lord, you call to a place of pilgrimage. And for all of us, Lord, we have a journey of life. We pray that you would illuminate our path and help us to follow you, Jesus, and to know your presence as we walk. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the Camino de Santiago, someone was asking uh, just what is that in terms of the words. Uh, Camino is Spanish word for way. Um, and so when we talk about the El Camino Real, right, we've got that here in California, uh, the Royal Way. And so the Camino is the way and Santiago is the uh, translation of St. James. So it's the way of St. James. Uh, St. James uh, is the saint that uh, Spain really looks to uh, in terms of his influence in the uh, first uh uh, decades in the early church, making an, an impact on the Iberian Peninsula. They believe that his bones are in the cathedral in Santiago, and so it's a destination for people and pilgrims. Uh, somewhere about the 10th century on, uh, the people have been walking to uh, Santiago in all those years. And so this is really a chance for me. It was an opportunity to be a part of a pilgrim path. Um, it's increased in popularity from the 1980s to uh, where we are now. Uh, and certainly uh, during the COVID close down, uh, once things opened up, uh, the number of pilgrims who were walking the Camino in uh, 2021, 2022, and then this year, I'll be interested to see what the total numbers are. But uh, uh, I went on this journey. Uh, and so uh, these are the the group of guys I walked with and arrived with on October 12th. And uh, we all got to the uh, uh, cathedral all at the same time. It was a little bit more of a challenging day on that final day, but I'll get to that day. But first, uh, I want to say that before everything started, we all, this group, uh, were part of a journey home cohort. And so I've got some pictures of uh, a retreat that we took earlier in, um, at the end of May. And uh, we all got together and we ate great food. Uh, we were telling stories, getting to know one another. And uh, it was really just a, a wonderful time together. Um, there we are, prayer time, talking. And the whole focus of this journey with us, uh, led by uh, John Huckins, who's in that picture. John is the uh, originator of the Journey Home uh, cohort. Uh, this is the second year of their ministry that they've been doing. Last year, they took a group for the first time and we're the second group. Uh, they're also taking another group in May. And so uh, it's uh, kind of rolling and revving up. Um, it's through the ministry that he did originally with um, a border ministry where they take people and a uh, global immersion project. Uh, and now John's kind of separating out of that and finding ways to bring uh, where the way he describes it as dominant culture men together for an experience to really think about the issues of identity, um, vocation, and leadership. How do we show up in the world? And so the main focus for all of us was on a spirituality of falling upward. Um, that's uh, a phrase that Richard Rohr pioneered uh, through his book uh, by the same title, Falling Upward. That's basically a pilgrimage where you've got two halves of life. The first half of life, you're kind of building your container or you're building your tower. And then there reaches a point where you can keep doing that same kind of work. <laughs> or you can realize that a lot of our work is to let go 
and to pour into others. And rather than having our life built more and more great, you begin to see that, that so much of life is how do we encourage one another and lift up uh, the next generation. And so it was a great experience in terms of uh, being a part of that. We had a mantra. We had a whole uh, kind of thing that we would read through whenever we got together on uh, that portion of the Camino and use that mantra uh, as a regular opportunity to reflect on the kind of lives that we wanted to live. Uh, lives of, I think, the, one of the phrases in it is extravagant tenderness about collaboration. Um, and that kind of work was a very intentional internal work uh, that we did a number of uh, homework projects where we just kind of had to sit and think and do a little bit of writing. Um, in fact, not a little bit of writing, had to do a lot of writing, uh, but all of that writing was coming out of a deeper reflection. Uh, so I have got my five word uh, kind of mission, personal mission statement. Uh, I had to articulate what are the things I'm letting go of on this journey. Uh, and it really helped me to clarify because part of a pilgrimage, the whole opportunity is to prepare to go and then on the road to be open to new kinds of learning and to... Uh, let go of some things, have a divine encounter, and then return a little bit different. And I feel like that really happened. It happened because I did both the Journey Home cohort, but I also, because if you know anything about the Enneagram, and I hope in the next year we'll do some things about uh, with the Enneagram, but the Enneagram is kind of a personality type. I am an Enneagram 7, which is the enthusiast. I'm all about, I'm all about adventure. Uh, and so it's, Pilgrimage is perfect for my Enneagram type. Uh, but I also have an eight wing, which is a challenger. Uh, and so I like challenges. I like, uh, I like challenging. Um, and so that's part of just the way I've been made. But because I'm that type of person, I thought, well, I'm going to go before the group starts to walk together and I'll do a solo week on the Camino. And so I want to share a little bit of my solo week on the Camino. Uh, I started walking on September 27th and got there, uh, uh, didn't get to Santiago, but just got as far along as I wanted to. These are the two kind of tokens that you carry on the Camino. One is a shell and the shell is representative of the fact that I'm on the uh, pilgrimage. And so pilgrims throughout the centuries have uh, either worn a shell or tied a shell to the backpack. And so this one clanged on the back of my backpack for, uh, for those weeks. And then you also have something called a pilgrim's passport. And uh, throughout the journey, you would uh, either stay somewhere or eat somewhere or drink somewhere. Uh, and they would say, oh, do you want a stamp? And so you get just this record of your journey, which is uh, really kind of cool. Um, I, you know, it, it, it sounds silly, but you start collecting these going like, oh, wait, we'll go. Do, they, do you have a stamp? Uh, and so I got as many stamps as I could. Uh, some just because I ate a burger. Um, uh, but uh, just a, a, a reminder of the journey we took. So leaving Santiago, this is a, a picture just down the, the first path. Um, the next slide, sorry. Uh, the path that I took was starting in Porto, uh, six days of walking. So each day I walked to uh, one of these cities. And so people have uh, asked several times, okay, well, how much walking, what did it look like? So I'm trying to see if this works or not. So we'll see. So there I am in Porto on the first day. I went to Via de Conde uh, the, on day one. Uh, there's a little more of that story that I'll share in a minute. On day two, I went to Espacendo, uh, Espacende. Uh, and so you can see between each of those is about 15 miles of walking. And then after Espacende on day three, I ended up in Viana de Costela. Um, that is a very big uh, cathedral uh, at the top of a mountain, and it was awesome. So 15, 15, 15, 45 miles of walking, and I said, <laughs> I'm going to like go a little smaller. And so uh, day four, I decided to walk just about five miles. Uh, <laughs> And then the next day, I got to that next city that's listed there, Viana Priya uh, de Ankara, uh, which was a beach town. It reminded me so much of Huntington Beach. All the coastal route on the Camino was like uh, the coast of California. And then I ended in Camina uh, on day six. So um, the 
final three days were like five miles each. The first three days were 15 miles each. I prefer five miles. Um, <laughs> part of my worry was if I walk a lot, um, I needed to then go and meet with the Journey Home group uh, and start walking again. And I was really concerned that if I blew out my legs uh, solo and then had trouble getting into Santiago, I really didn't want to be embarrassed by the fact that I, maybe I walked too much. And so uh, it kind of took some rest days and then headed back to Porto. Uh, and it was, it was great. There's kind of a, a picture of all of that. Uh, normally you would go from uh, Camina and then move inland uh, and do the central route there or get, go up to Vigo. Uh, so there's all kinds of different paths you can take. So the Camino de Santiago is not one route. Uh, it's actually a whole collection of ways that you can get there. So there's no one official. You can imagine in Europe, as they were coming from all different places, they wouldn't fly to France to leave from there. Uh, they would leave from wherever they are. And so... Uh, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great trip for me. I started, uh, and this is, I think the next picture is me starting in Porto. See how happy I am and ready to go and fresh. Uh, that's day one. And uh, Porto and the, all the way up, there are so many rivers that are coming out to the ocean uh, through Portugal and Spain. And that's one. Uh, let's see what we've got next. Um, this is what the coastal route basically looked like. Uh, a boardwalk um, as you're walking along with trekking poles. <laughs> one thing you've got to be aware of is those little gaps between uh, the, uh, the slats. And so I was literally on a conversation with my wife, Joy, because we had an international plan so I could call home. And I'm like, I'm on day one having a great time. Uh-oh. <laughs> I just grabbed that little, uh, that little uh, the rubber tip on the end of it and brought it right to the bottom of the boardwalk. Thankfully, I had an extra one. But um, this is what it was, and the coastal route was just beautiful. Um, to be clear, the coastal route is very unlikely to be one of the ancient routes because this boardwalk wasn't built back then. And so you've got to be willing to say, like, this isn't original or... Um, I'm all about like, hey, we can actually have some modifications and not have to be so pure about things. In fact, we don't have to be as pure as you might think. So I'll explain that. This is me uh, on the coastal route. Um, the next thing that I came to was this uh, pile of seaweed that I couldn't figure out. All the way up the coast, there were these... Uh, piles of seaweed wrapped in plastic and sometimes they would have bricks or big blocks or boards on top of them and it took me a while to figure out what in the world is that um, and it relates something to the whole of the countryside both in Portugal and Spain they do a lot in terms of the cultivation of their land um, you have a sense of like they're caring for growing spaces. This was so that this would, organic material would break down and they would eventually mix it and use it as fertilizer uh, for the plants. When you've got things like uh, vineyards and growing space, you can't just leave the dirt to care for itself, but the dirt has to be soil where organic things grow. And so I was really pleased to see so much of that. Um, the next image is uh, my lesson one on the whole of the Camino was to learn to pay attention. Um, paying attention wasn't easy because you'd be walking on the Camino and the way you would know you're on the Camino either uh, by seeing uh, an arrow or a shell. And so I was happily moving down this street and see that little thing? I didn't see that. So I just walked right by it and kept on my merry way. And then, I don't know, maybe a half mile later, I thought, you know, I haven't seen a yellow arrow in a long time. Uh, and so I had to backtrack. But I thought, I'm going to take a picture of that. Um, I was really happy walking. Here I am uh, on the boardwalk, just saying, this is great. Um, had to remind myself always to keep the ocean on my left. Um, so that so this is looking back, uh, keep the ocean on the left and uh, continue walking and hopefully you'll get to your destination. Day one, I found myself in this space right here, um, some fields uh, where they're growing things. I had walked inland for a little while in search of my uh, place to stay that night. Uh, the farther I walked, the narrower the road 
And the narrower the road, the faster the cars. <laughs> and I was like, uh-oh. I hadn't made a plan uh, that first day. I was just going to figure it out. <laughs> so I had to stop. And this is me contemplating. <laughs> like, hmm. Those are my straps to carry the weight on my hips. And i am got my trekking poles there. And I'm like, oh, what should I do? I can keep walking. Once I mapped it out, I realized the uh, hostel that I had booked was another four miles in. And I thought, oh, no. This is going to be a problem. So with my trusty phone, I found my Uber app. Because <laughs> pilgrims... I'm sure in the 13th and 14th century would have used every resource available to them. So I called an Uber and the gentleman came out. I got in the car. I was still fumbling around. The way they work with uh, addresses, totally different than us. Uh, I don't know. They just put things in different order. And so I had ordered this Uber. I got in the car. We're driving. And he says, I hear this ping on his phone. He says, wait a second. How did you do that? And I said, do what? He said, you just ordered an Uber to take you to the destination you were already at. <laughs> he said, I didn't think that was possible. And I was tired. And I said, I didn't think it's possible either. He said, where do you want to go? And I said, well, I want to go. And I took out my phone. And I said, here. And just then my phone goes, zoom. It was dead. I didn't have it charged. And I was like, I don't know where. I'm trying to remember the name of it. So we finally figured out where it was. This guy was so kind. Uh, he's from just one of the neighboring cities. Uh, he's driving for Uber. Started sharing his own life story. It was, a, it was an awesome connection. His name was Ricardo Rocha. Uh, and he took such wonderful care of me because he took me out to the hostel I was going to stay at. But it was so far out. I looked at him and I said, you can't leave me here. <laughs> And he said, okay. So he took me to the gas station because he needed gas. Um, he refused to take any money. And he plugged my phone in and charged it while we waited. And then he eventually took me to the next stop. And even uh, the stop of the at Via de Conde uh, stopped there. I said, you can't drop me off right here in front of it. Can you drive down there so I can walk? <laughs> Look like I'm fresh. So... Just so you know, following the sermon today, uh, day one, I'm a fraud. I'm a fraud already as a, uh, as a pilgrim. Uh, what's funny is that the, I was very, I mean, because of the story, I was a little embarrassed by all of that and feeling like, mm. the longer I walked in my solo week on the Camino, the more I found out that people had more Uber stories uh, than anyone else. And so... Uh, you don't have to be a purist, but I would say that the lesson two that I learned for sure, if you need help, ask for it. Um, and that, that's in so many different ways. If you need help, just ask for it. Uh, as I said, walking up, uh, the next slide is like on the California coast. There were um, spaces where the surf was pounding, uh, some of it over rocky shore, some of it on good surf breaks, and it just felt like we were kind of uh, heading up the California coast, and it was beautiful. Rivers that intersect in all kinds of different places, and so you've got bridges that you've got to walk over. Um, but it's just kind of a meandering stroll along the, uh, the coast. Uh, as I got a little more into it, found myself in places that weren't so coastal, uh, but uh, surprising in different ways. The next two images are a hospitality station that just happened in the middle of like nowhere. We're all walking uh, up these uh, small pathways and all of a sudden uh, tents, refrigerators, food is all there and available. No one is attending it. But it says that if you want to eat something, take it. If you want to leave a donation, leave it. Here's a stamp if you want a stamp. And it was just an amazing, like, wow. Uh, I don't know exactly how they, oh, that's good. I don't know how exactly they make it all work, uh, but they do. Um, and so if you go back one, if you can go back. Uh, yeah, this woman here is from Scotland. Um, she's working on her doctorate. 
uh, in musicology, and in her backpack, that is a very oversized backpack, she has an amplifier. Uh, walked with her, you'll see her in another picture, walked with uh, her and some other friends for a few days, but it was just amazing. Uh, this is the picture of all of us. The picture before that, we had been eating together at two different tables, and both the tables started going back and forth, and so you just start through conversation. It's one of the few places in the world where you can just, hey, we are... Um, uh, we're all on this journey and we're all open to talking and conversations and friends. And so you start walking together. Um, this is us going across the bridge into uh, whatever city was next. Um, there we are and following the arrows and the shell. And uh, it was just a fantastic time. Uh, you end up in places uh, like this to the next one. Uh, this is where we got up to Via uh, uh, Castella, or Castello. Uh, there was a cathedral that uh, is at the top of this mountain. We actually took a trolley or a train to get all the way up to it. Uh, it was just too far to walk. Uh, and then stayed, and the, the sunset was just absolutely incredible. Um, that's what it looked like, a blanket of clouds. You can see the city underneath and the, the water out there. Um, but the beauty in the whole of the place was just amazing. I think the next picture is leaving that city. Um, they do all kinds of things that just highlight the beauty of it. And then sometimes the accommodations were pretty basic in terms of they give you a bunk bed and a place uh, to catch a shower, but sometimes they were really nice. And this is one of the best places I stayed. Uh, in Careco, uh, I had uh, 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 intended to go up there and swim, and then I got in a conversation uh, with this gentleman. Uh, his name is Matthias, and uh, Matthias owns a canoe business in Germany. And uh, we started talking, and he shared some things that were just uh, powerful to me. Uh, some of his uh, frustration in terms of uh, what the church sometimes does, and, in terms of manipulating and using people. And uh, I, I had, uh, had just to listen. He didn't know what I did yet. <laughs> But even when he found out, he was really agreeable. And just, we had some uh, great conversations. We ran into each other a number of times, which is the way it all works. Um, if you try too hard to keep what you have in terms of like the people you meet, uh, sometimes you're going to meet them and have a great conversation and it'll go deep or maybe it'll just be on the surface. Uh, you might run into them again. You might never see them again, but you just have this sense of uh, appreciating what's there. With him, it was good. I think the next slide I say that uh, the resistance to religion is real and, and it's often rooted in experience. Sometimes people have stories about why uh, faith is not something they're interested in. And sometimes uh, it's good just to hear them out and to come alongside and try to understand what is it that we need to do to do something different. And so uh, I think one of the most powerful uh, conversations I had was around this table uh, with some of the people from the walk earlier. And we just had a fantastic time talking about uh, God and our lives and meaning and why we're walking in the Camino. And so uh, the one girl uh, just to the right of Simon, uh, her name was Leaf. And I was saying to them that I believe that my whole life, like what my purpose is, is teach people to love. And I asked them, does that sound silly? And I was feeling a little bit like it did. And they were like, no, that's a very, I mean, that's important to do. And I said, you know, I want to teach people how to love God. I want to teach people how to love their neighbor. And then Leif uh, said, well, what about yourself? And, and that was one of the more powerful experiences I realized that our Christianity can't be kind of a heroic, love God, love people. We also have to do it out of the reality that we ourselves are loved by God and how good it is to belong to a community where we continue to remind ourselves of that. So going from there, I walked this uh, uh, picture where I think that is so much like Huntington Beach. Um, I actually got into that town, the, uh, the 
ocean at the time was locked in with fog. And so uh, I didn't know what the surf out there looked like. Stopped by a little place where you could rent a board. Thought seriously about it. And then I thought, no, I don't think I'm going to surf in Portugal. Uh, but it was very tempting. That night I actually spent a lot of time um, uh, just on the little boardwalk there. The hostel I was staying at was right on the beach. Um, I think I paid 15 euros for it. So pretty good deal, um, and uh, uh, sat out there with Matthias, and he and I just uh, ordered beers from the bar, carried the beer steins over, and sat on the beach, and just had a great conversation. Uh, so different than you can do here. <laughs> uh, the regulations there aren't quite as strict, but it was just a, a, a wonderful time, um, and it got me also, I don't want to sound like the whole time I'm just, you know, going from one party to the next, uh, but the whole walking, uh, that sense of devoting yourself to, to a single task as simple as walking and then spending hours at a time focused on that uh, made me consider what contemplative walking is all about. It's about as you walk, learning to listen to God, uh, learning to listen to others, and learning to listen to yourself. And, and just the rhythm of it or the, the intensity or the, the length of it after a while becomes the sense of a contemplative uh, experience. And you don't avoid your pain. You also become very aware of it. I'm thankful that uh, up to this point, I didn't have any blisters. And I was feeling so proud of the fact uh, that I didn't have any blisters. I felt like my legs were in good shape. Uh, thanks also to Charles Whitney, uh, who before I left, Charles, uh, uh, who does amazing work as a chiropractor and a therapist uh, related to muscle work, uh, worked out my legs in a way that I'm not sure I would have made it without his help. But you get to that place where your, your body is kind of in tune with all of it, and it's, and it's deeply satisfying. Um, but where I didn't get a blister, one thing I did is I ruined a toenail, uh, ripped it right up. Uh, and so uh, I've got this little uh, purple nail on one of my toes, uh, my right foot. And uh, everybody kept saying the same thing. I don't know. They were like, oh, good. You'll have a souvenir when you get home. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's growing out, so it's, uh, it's the least of my worries for sure. But when I talk about listening to others, this next uh, picture was just this little, I, I don't know if it was a small little church gathering. On the other side of it that you can't see, because um, I didn't know until I got around there, uh, there was a woman selling bracelets. And I almost bought a bracelet, but nothing really fit my style and so I didn't but she gave me one of the uh, best uh, instructions or just uh, what to do in terms of the walk ahead she said when you get up to that place and the yellow arrows turn you to the right just stay to the left and keep on walking along the coast because you'll meet up again with the Camino and you'll be able to walk all that as coastal and you'll miss all the commerce that they're trying to move you into so if you, if you need something at the store or you want to buy something, go that way. But uh, it just is a reminder that in some ways the Camino is a mix of it's not purely religious or spiritual. Um, it does have some uh, tourist uh, things to it. So I stayed on the path and there it was, walked up there and just had a blast. And actually when I got up a little bit farther, I decided uh, based on my friend Matthias, uh, I decided to kick off my shoes and walk barefoot for a while. So I took the little carabiner on my backpack, tied my shoes on, and just started walking. Um, he would feel the little, if you look at the path there, those are pine needles. And I'm like, ouch, 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 okay. I'm going to get them. There were some larger sand places, uh, but got all the way to the beach in Camina and just enjoyed uh, in the sand. Um, Walking, And this probably was one of those days that I felt this sense of like, ah, I knew it was day six. I knew it was the day that I was going to be finished walking my solo time. And so I literally was just kind of like going like, oh, I'm so grateful. I'm so happy. Um, and, and it was wonderful. I started writing in the sand. And so I wrote on the way outside, which is kind of my tagline uh, of life. I think that 
all of my life, I want to be on the way outside. And part of it is the way of Jesus, but also Jesus is always going to the outside to be with people right where they are. And so I wrote some other ones. Uh, I Heart Joy was one of them, so I sent that home. Uh, but uh, as I was there in my ears, uh, there was a song that meant a lot to me uh, through this. And these are the lyrics for it. I'm not going to play the song um, but it's a song from an album called Sanctuary Songs uh, done by a group called Porter's Gate. And Porter's Gate's offering these songs because they believe that these are healing songs, songs that we need in terms of our relationship with God. And this is one called Centering Prayer that I thought was just brilliant. The words are this, I want to be where my feet are. I want to breathe the life around me. I want to listen to my heartbeat right on time. I want to be where my feet are. I chase my worries. I flee my sorrows. But what you give me is now. So take my burdens and my tomorrows. I want to be where my feet are. The second verse goes like this. I run to capture the next horizon. But what you give me is here. I get no farther and still I find you. I want to be where my feet are. And so for me, this was a great conclusion to the, to the week of just kind of being present and, and the gift that God gives us when we are right where we are and we know we're where we're supposed to be. And so from there, the shift comes because we go from that to, uh, again, some more uh, beautiful boardwalks in my backpack there. We go from there to back to Porto to, the, to welcome the Journey Home Group. So uh, in Kaminha, I caught a fast train going all the way back to Porto, which is really kind of sad. You realize I've been walking six days and I got back to Porto in about an hour. Uh, <laughs> so it's just this like, whoa, uh, technology and what we're used to. Uh, I mean, think about it. Uh, we typically don't walk anywhere in our society today other than if you get a far away parking spot and have to all walk all the way to Trader Joe's um, but we usually typically don't walk so it was kind of a, a, a jarring moment when I realized how fast uh, uh, I could get back and how how far I really didn't how far I didn't go and so uh, I got back to Porto and I've got a series of pictures here it was the Journey Home Group gathering uh, that's Max uh, there speaking uh, we had our first dinner on October 4th. Uh, I told the director, John Hawkins, I said, you know, it's been a long time since I've had a date ahead of me that I've been more excited about, but I knew that on October 4th at five o'clock that I would be in Porto, Portugal, gathering with all of these friends. And I think the last time I had a date that I was as excited about was uh, May 14th, 1988, when I got married, five o'clock also. Uh, so it had been that long till I really had something like drawing me. And so there we are uh, enjoying our time around the table. Uh, we were just getting started. One of the things I liked because I was there without any jet lag, everyone else was coming in. They were all seeing Porto for the first time that I had been there before. And so there was this sense of watching them watch the city was fantastic. So going to the next slide. There we are at the top of a uh, bridge. Uh, we were all excited to be there. Uh, everybody had made it. Uh, we walked from there across the bridge to the other side of Porto. There's Max uh, taking pictures. Uh, he at one point came, uh, there was a part of the city, and we were walking to the uh, place where he had checked in, and there was uh, a part, and he ran, and he jumped up on this wall, looked over, and it was about a 300-foot drop. <laughs> but he was so excited, he was like, oh, and then we stepped back off. Uh, but it was just, uh, it was fantastic. There I am with this group. Everybody was gathered up here for one reason, and the run, one reason was just to watch the sunset. So there we are all talking. We're all kind of checking in. And I think there's a one final sunset shot. Yeah. I mean, it was just beautiful. Um, the thing about that is that you do have this sense of a different pace of things. I realize when we go places on vacation or whatever, it's that different pace that really is, is, is so... Uh, 
it's so good for our soul. Um, instead of the hurrying, going, doing. Um, so many people just gathering to watch the sunset. Next slide. So eight days to Santiago. Um, I think I uh, post, go ahead in the next. Um, this is the, the plan. We were gonna go from Porto by van. We went up to a place called Ponte de Lima. And then each day uh, we had these gaps between. I tried to make the same kind of like, uh, hey, you can see a map, uh, but it didn't quite work out as well. So just know these are big gaps between these cities. Uh, this is a, a lot of walking. We went from Ponte Vedre, we went to this uh, monastery. Uh, which is a part of the spiritual variant of the Camino. That area has a way that's not on the regular Camino, but is a spiritual variant that takes you to a monastery. And where do you build a monastery? At the top of a mountain. And so not only do you get to get up that mountain, you then get to get down that mountain and back on the Camino. We ended up in a, a seaside city called Villanova de Rosa. And then we took a boat um, the only place I think in the world that has the stations of the cross built into the waterfront, um, we would take uh, on our boat ride, stop at all the stations of the cross all the way up to uh, Padron. And I've got some pictures of us there. Unfortunately, the departure time from there was dependent on the tides. And so our boat didn't leave until 1030. And then it took us till after 12 to arrive there. So on the final day, I think I put it in there. Nope. Uh, on the final day, we had a lot of walking. So I'll get to that. So this is us leaving. Uh, we got the boat up to, um, uh, not the boat, we had taken the van up to uh, Ponta de Lima. And this is us leaving, or just arriving in Ponta de Lima. And this, yeah, this man has a business that is a wood shop and he sends pilgrims on their way. The man who is uh, with his back to us is Matthew Ziprick. He was one of our Camino guides. He's a pastor in Canada. And he's showing a picture to this man because a year ago they were there uh, in the same place of departure and Matt, Matt had a picture of the two of them together and so he's saying, I'm back again. Um, next picture is of him sending us off. Uh, he was like straight out of the Middle Ages. I mean, uh, the way he was dressed, the work he was doing, it was the best place to start the Camino um, because... Uh, he offered a blessing to us, and if you see the bell above him, he said that he wanted to send the pilgrims off one at a time. And so as the 16 of us were gathered around, he then offered a blessing, and then he held the string of the bell and went ding, and one would leave. Ding, and another would leave. So one by one, we all departed out of there. And it was just this sense of like, whoa, that was cool. There's all of our group there um, ready to depart. And that first day was just fantastic. Uh, so walking with the group uh, and the choice always uh, to walk either together or by yourself. Um, different from the um, original uh, coastal route, this felt very Camino-ish. Uh, you can just see the flavor, the land, uh, so much different than, uh, than what I had seen before. And so walking through these vineyards gave you a sense of um, really being in a very special place. Um, this picture in, uh, actually was deeply moving for me. Each night we would like check in and say what's, uh, what we observed, what was going on in our day. And this particular picture uh, or this particular uh, view really caught me. Those are very thick um, uh, olive, or not olive, they're uh, wine uh, branches going up. You can tell it's been cultivated for a long, long time. And yet there are new branches growing off it. And I just thought, you know, wherever we are in life, we may have been around here for a long time to be those thick branches. If we're tended properly and carefully, new growth keeps coming out. And I just kind of marvel at the beauty. And, and part of it is, is the, uh, the care of the people for the land that they have. Um, that it's not just all commercial property with houses, but it's a place where things are growing. And they're growing because they fertilize it and take care of it. And one of the things that really 
caught me was the smell. And I mean the smell, right? Sometimes the smell, woo! And sometimes the smell in terms of the beauty of growing things. So organic land, sheep, goats, birds, bugs, fragrant trees and plants, ordinary people. I think it's that fragrance or smell is one of the few or maybe it's the only of our five senses that actually moves us to a place of contemplation. Have you ever had an experience? You can't hurry up smell, can you? When you smell something, what is that? And, and you've got to think about it. Sight, you can get overwhelmed. Sound, overwhelmed. Smell, there's something about us that, about it that really slows us down. And I would say... Uh, the other place that I experienced the same thing was Costa Rica. The sense of like, just the way the land smells different than California. I think we try so hard to cover up anything that doesn't, it isn't pleasing. And I, I, I'm not saying that it smelled so great all the time. I'm just, uh, was more aware of it. And that, that somewhat surprised me. So we continued on walking. This is another pathway. Um, uh, you can see that yellow arrow there just tucked in. That's the thing you're always looking for to make sure you're still on the Camino. Next picture is uh, uh, Luke, who's from Minnesota. He was there. Yeah, we both had the same shoes, only all the material that made one of my shoes, um, uh, or one of his shoes probably made both of my shoes. He wore size 14. <laughs> I'm a little petite, uh, size eight and a half. Uh, but we're sitting, this is the uh, a fortress in Valencia. Uh, Valencia is on the Portugal side, Tui is on the other. Uh, and guess what? The Spanish built a fort on their side too. So for hundreds of years, these two places fought each other. But it was wonderful to be there. And then we were using John Briarley's guidebook. This is uh, Billy. Uh, our Catholic interpreter for the whole of the trip. Uh, Spain is a very Catholic country. Uh, Billy was on with us. He serves a Catholic school up in Northern California. He was fantastic. Uh, he actually read scripture at one of the places uh, where we uh, gathered for worship uh, in the service for the people. It was fantastic. Um, you can see just the beauty of the river as you cross, walking across. I think we were going into Tui. And there we are getting in, finding our place. Uh, one of the other, when we talk about smell, one of the other things I enjoyed uh, quite a lot was the thick coffee. And that's what it looked like. Um, I do not drink uh, uh, any sugar in my coffee here. The only way I think to drink coffee there is to sugar it up. So uh, I got used to uh, sugared coffee and uh, enjoyed it very much. Typically espresso uh, or Americanos, uh, and, and it was great. But you'd arrive in a city and see, oh, there's that. Um, is there about, yeah, you'd arrive in a city and see a building like this. Uh, and this is not like Disneyland. Uh, these are bricks, stones, uh, things that are carved out. I mean, you just get this sense of uh, the durability and how long they've been there. Every night we would do a check-in time. Uh, I think that's the next slide. Uh, sit around as a group. Here we are in a park. Um, we uh, were there sharing with one another, and then it became obvious that a bunch of kids were wanting to get on the playground equipment, so we had to wrap up. Uh, but every night we would just sit around and uh, everyone would have the opportunity to talk about how the day went for them. What were the learnings? Uh, what did they uh, get out of it? What are they wrestling with? Uh, it was a fantastic time. Uh, the groups that I would walk with, sometimes you would walk uh, with others. Sometimes you would walk alone. Uh, the gentleman in the middle there, his name is Steve. Uh, and he got into a rhythm of uh, waking us early. Uh, or he woke early, and if you wanted to walk with him, you better get on board, and uh, he was fantastic. We were walking very early one morning. We had shared stories about uh, the adoption of his children, and I shared about my granddaughter, and so it was just this kind of time of connection, and then we arrive at this, there would be little, like, um, I, I don't know what you would... Uh, uh, spaces where people would leave things in remembrance of others or uh, uh, a site where uh, some kind of sacrifice or something would be made. We arrived there, walk up, and he said, I want to do this here. 
So uh, I've been carrying these two rocks. They're from my adopted children, and I'd really like to leave them here. Uh, and, and so it was just a wonderful, like, moment of like I'm going to dedicate myself even more fully and so I asked to hold the rocks and then I gave them back and with a blessing and then he gave them to Dom who was there with us and that is so typical of what Steve Denny is like he inspired me so much in terms of his enthusiasm for walking it was a it was a powerful experience and he's a good friend um, you would go across places um, where um, this is Matthew Ziprick. Uh, you would be coming up on locations. Uh, the bridge ahead of us there is a bridge that was built by the Romans. And so you know as long as different from the, um, different from the uh, places like uh, boardwalks, you know that the Camino always had that as one of the elements to it. So there it is, uh, built by the Romans, first century. So as long as the Camino has been walked, uh, this has been a bridge that uh, carried uh, people across. Uh, reminded me, like, I want to make it sound like all that we did worked really well. There was one experience. We stayed at a hostel, and uh, the hostel was uh, not just for us, but there were had multiple rooms, and uh, a lot of those rooms were occupied with a group of high school girls. Um, noisy high school girls. I think there were probably 40 or 50 of them. And they were kind of loud. And uh, for one of the rooms, they kept uh, one of the adjacent rooms that was connected to them. I think they made noise all night. And so some people in our group woke up and were a little irritated by it. One in particular. And I won't name names because I don't want to put him on the spot. And it was not me. Uh, <laughs> But he was walking uh, the next day and he was, you know, trekking along and still feeling a little grumpy because he didn't get a good night of sleep. And just then he looked ahead and thought, oh, no, there they all are. I really, he, he said he'd really love to like chart a path around them, but he realized he needed to walk by them. And so as he's walking by, they stopped him and they said, oh, would you please take a picture for us? And he was like, oh, Okay. And then he started realizing that he was maybe a little grumpier than he needed to be. And so he took the camera. And so he took the camera and they got them all lined up. And he took the picture. And he said, just as I was handing the camera back to them, they all at once said, thank you. And he said, they didn't even count down. You know how you count down for that? Usually you're like, oh, okay, one, two, three, thank you. And he's like overwhelmed by it. And he said that it just so softened him. Like, you know what, sometimes you need to get outside yourself and serve other people. That was one of my favorite stories that was shared one of the nights. Uh, we got to a place called Pontevedra. Uh, Pontevedra is a uh, uh, place on the route. That's Micah. Micah serves a church called Awaken in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, and uh, we had some great conversations. Their church has six practices that they do. And one of the practices is pilgrimage. And so we started talking about pilgrimage. This is how he frames it. He says, pilgrimage is um, preparing, uh, leaving something behind, and then having that encounter, a sacred encounter, and then returning. And it was actually that comment about returning that helped me realize after I had been back from the Camino a few days, is all I could think of is, I want to go back. And then I realized, you can't. I mean, you could another time, but you've got to return. You've got to come back. You can't just be on the perpetual vacation. And so uh, that was helpful for me. This next image is my favorite image of the whole. This is us leaving Pontevedra uh, in the early morning. If you, if you would walk early in the morning before the light would come out, you'd be much better off uh, later in the day. So you don't have to necessarily walk in the heat of it. Go to the next this is the spiritual variant. And just so you know, the spiritual variant um, was a challenge. Go to the next. We're uh, at the top of the hill. Those are the other two stones. I didn't know it at the time, but those other two rocks that are on the um, 
uh, to, to the left of the picture there. Those are the two rocks that Steve Denny carried all the way up the mountain uh, as another token of uh, how he wanted to serve the Lord. I was like, God, this guy's... I mean, I would just take a couple pebbles. I think that <laughs> could get the same thing. But the spiritual variant really was a place where we went off. Uh, there was a monastery up there. We were a part of the service there, a blessing of pilgrims. Uh, but on the conversation up there, as I mentioned earlier, Max had a conversation with a group of women from Brazil. And people walk the, pilgrim, or walk the route for all kinds of different reasons. This was a group of women who were walking the route with the intention of experiencing healing in their lives because they had all suffered the trauma of physical abuse from their husbands or boyfriends. And in conversation, Max was saying why we were there, that we were there as a group of men seeking to live the kind of life that was about lifting people up and not tearing them down. And so I think that he even shared the mantra, our mantra with them so that they would hear it and know. And he said that the sense of uh, gra gratitude around the circle that he shared with, that people are actually doing that work to make a better world was really pretty amazing. And so I think it is uh, helpful for us to be reminded that sometimes the work that we do uh, can really make a big difference in the world. Um, this was the, uh, the monastery at the top. By then I had caught a cold. <laughs> so my whole goal throughout the service, their beautiful singing, was to eat one cough drop after another and try not to cough. Uh, I sat next to a woman uh, who was all tatted up and uh, also kind of experiencing the moment and uh, ran, ran into her a little later. But I have to say, I would love to go back and be a little more present for that, but that was a great uh, experience. The monastery uh, outside looked like that. The next day we went on the path called uh, Water and Stone. This was a pathway from the top of the mountain all the way down because the rivers that were flowing there, uh, it was uh, uh, some stone uh, uh, spaces that were uh, carved out. Uh, and that was really my day of solitude. Uh, I took that as an opportunity to probably do more journaling than I had done uh, any time uh, up to that place. Uh, did some more inner reflection. And part of what I was feeling was a real sense of sadness because what I got used to is just walking and looking for shells and seeing if I'm still on the arrow. And what I realized that second to the last day before we got to Santiago is that it was all going to be over. And I thought, oh. So I uh, continued to push on. And as I did, uh, Got to see beauty like this, some, doing some real personal reflection, and then ran into this woman who, as she was walking, I think she's next. Yep, as she was walking, was literally walking like this, with one knee that bent and the other didn't bend. <laughs> because when she left Porto, she walked too far the first day and she blew out her knee. And yet, Naomi was one of the most joyful people I met on the trip. No complaint. We walked and talked and shared, and it was fantastic. Uh, as we were coming into that, this is the second to the last day, um, I decided, you know, there's a lot of things in life we just need to let go of. I mean, she's walking without her knee bending and having a great time. Boy, I could learn a lot. So I took off my shoes and uh, spent a little bit of time walking along the beach. Let's see what that next picture is. Um, yeah, that's it uh, of that. Um, the day ended with uh, a, a, a night of bold, vulnerable, loving affirmations. We sat around and shared our stories, um, spoke to one another. I think the picture is there. Four and a half hours around the circle, uh, we talked about each other and to each other, uh, offered uh, uh, what we had seen through the friendship and relationship and really blessed uh, there were several things said that night that I just feel like I'm going to continue to carry. One was my sadness about the yellow arrows. Steve Denny reminded me that yellow arrows, God's leading shows up every place in our life. And we just have to pay attention to it. My worry is that sometimes I'm not always confident about those yellow arrows. Or sometimes I feel lost and maybe I'm not on the path. 
but I think the confidence is that, uh, that God leads us anyway. So going from there, we jumped on the boat. This is my friend Mike. Uh, we walked into Santiago together. We jumped on the boat, rode all the way from uh, the coastal city we were in to uh, Padron. This is uh, pictures taken by my friend Nate, who's a professional photographer. You can tell he takes really good pictures. Uh, three of us there were in the group, and this man going like this, we just thought looked like the coolest dude we had met on the Camino. <laughs> so he was uh, walking the Camino with his niece. Uh, his name is Leo. And uh, we were just kind of catching up, getting to know one another. And uh, I just thought that was one of the most fun pictures. Uh, we had to take the boat uh, from Villanova de Rosa to Padron. Uh, we got there after uh, uh, noon. And so had a lot of walking to do, because this is how far we had to walk. Uh, 25.6 kilometers, which is 15.9 miles. And not only was it a distance, but it was elevation too. We had to get over two different peaks. And so, few pictures, because we were walking really fast. I looked back in my, my roll and went, ah, I don't have very much. I think I have one. And that's of Mike taking a picture of a goat. Anytime we would go by goats, I think his wife likes goats. And so we would always have to stop and take a picture of the goat. So we were moving. And you would think that having walked as far as we did, that by the time we got there, that I'd be feeling the sense of joy. But I wasn't feeling really joy. Here's what I was feeling. My nose was bleeding, so I'm kind of, the batting it. It wasn't bad, but it was just there. And I'm like, my eyes were watering. I still had the persistent cough and my legs were just tired. So we finally arrived to Santiago. This is the picture of the cathedral from the square where everyone gathers. And I wish I could sound like I was more, you know, with it. Like mm, my voice was good, but my voice was shot. But when we got there, the cathedral bells were ringing, and I recorded this. So, full day, uh, going all the way, walking from Padron to Santiago. Um, I think it was like 26 kilometers, so it's quite a quite a venture. But uh, we arrived just in time for the bells. It's awesome. This is all of us uh, right in front of the cathedral. We got there, bells were ringing. Uh, amazingly, all 16 of us arrived, uh, some a little bit earlier, but uh, uh, we weren't the last to arrive, uh, but we were close to it. So we all just got into Santiago. Pictures. My buddy Joe, Luke, Jeff. Over there, bells are ringing. What a joyful day! Uh, and then uh, from there, did a closing ritual. And the closing ritual was talking about the tower that you've built in life, what needs to be released, and how to enter the next stage of life. Uh, and it was a very powerful experience. Um, I spoke about my gratitude for my family and the fact that I'm moving into a new chapter, uh, not as a father, but a grandfather, and the difference of that. And we had to take a little token from the day that we found that would represent it. And for me, it was a fragrant uh, part of a tree that used to be in the back of my grandfather's house that whenever I smell it, it reminds me of being in my back, the backyard of my grandpa. And I just said, what I want more than anything in life to live a fragrant life that's fruitful that would really make a difference in the lives of my kids and the lives of my grandkids. And so it was this sense of letting go of what uh, has been to this point and then just embracing uh, whatever contribution I might continue to make. Um, we then ended by going through and having all of us say either on the one side of the group, uh, welcome home, and to the other, you are loved. Welcome home, you are home, you are loved which I think is a great reminder. Now, all of that, uh, the next day, we go from there to the Pilgrim's Mass. The only thing I wanted to do, not the only thing, but one of the biggest things I wanted to do uh, on this Camino is to see what is known as the Buta Famario. That's that big swinging incense burner that happens in the cathedral. And all the way to Santiago, people kept telling me, you know, they don't do that very often. That's very rare. And so I thought, ugh, 
that's what I wanted to see. So we go to the Pilgrim's Mass, and when we get to the Pilgrim's Mass, there is the biggest line you've ever seen. A bunch of people all over waiting to get in. It was so much so that I wasn't sure we were going to get in. But we got in. And then it happened. I got to see it. This is not a picture I took. This is a picture I found on the internet. Um, and I decided this is uh, not a picture I took. This is a picture. This is, let's see if it plays. This is what my friends played. I'm right there. So I'm sitting there. When I realized that they were going to do it, I found myself just overwhelmed with like, <gasps> because I was trying to get out of the cathedral just before it happened because I was just making a poor decision and they wouldn't let us out. And I was like, okay. So grumpily, I go to the front and as I'm going to the front, the six guys in those red capes walked by and I went, <gasps> And at that point, I just became overwhelmed. I started crying. I mean, I was just like, Whoa! I'm crying so, like, I can't believe that I'm here. And, and as I'm crying, there's a family there. Um, and the woman looks over at me and she's like, are you okay? And I'm like, it was all I could say. It was like, and through my raspy voice, I came all the way from California. This is what I wanted to see more than anything. <laughs> And they just came and they were so kind. They were so comforting. I spoke no Spanish. They spoke no English. We were just like together. And they were like, I think we need to be around you. And I just sat there and I thought I could take out my phone and record it. Or I could just be there in the moment. And so the song, I want to be where my feet are, came back to me. And I thought, I want to be where my feet are. And I'm just going to sit here and see this happen. And there are two things about it that I love. Number one is it's dangerous. We hardly ever do dangerous things in church. I'm not saying we're going to get a Buddha from Mario here, but, but we just are always careful about things, right? Uh, we had someone in our group calculate the speed of the thing because he works for Boeing. He was an engineer, and he said it's 45 miles an hour, and the impact, what the impact would be. It would kill you if you stepped in front of it. But the other thing is, is that incense, back to fragrance, that incense filling the cathedral, that sense of God's presence with us. In Revelation, it talks about the prayers of the people rising as incense. It was spectacular. <laughs> it was awesome. So I just had that moment, and I was so grateful for it. After that, and I'll be quick here, I'm wrapping up. So uh, after that, there was a final ritual that we needed to observe, and this was a ritual of ink and friendship. Um, the ink is on the back of my leg, permanently a uh, tattoo. Uh, this is Mike's tattoo. I walked into Santiago with him, and then... He wrote, this is our, from our WhatsApp uh, group thing. If you walk into Santiago together, you get a tattoo together. Steve Wright's turn. And so on the back of my leg, I have a shell. And it says, Buen Camino, which is the blessing that pilgrims offer to one another. And so I thought, like, my day is complete. I've gone to the Pilgrim's Mass. I've seen the Buddha from Mario. I've gotten a tattoo. Like, how could this day get any better? And I start walking around Santiago. Who do I run into? All of these people. I met Robert and Kaminha. I met Reed on the very first day of walking out of Porto. We ran into each other again on the spiritual variant, and we ran into each other again in Santiago. The uh, uncle, along with his niece, uh, Julio and Leo, were there. And just as I'm walking away from them saying, who else could I see? Naomi. I mean, I literally walked away saying, oh my gosh, my day is so full. Who else could I see? Naomi. <laughs> so she walked up and it was just this sense of, of friendship, reunion, feeling so full and grateful. So I'm walking along trying to get back to my room and I realize 
once again, I am lost. Because I thought it was this direction. And so I'm wandering this way, thinking I'll go catch that road. And then I realize, I look on my phone and realize, I'm walking in the complete opposite direction. So I turn around and I start going back. And as I'm going back, those were the families that comforted me in the cathedral. <laughs> I look up and I see it. I'm like, oh my gosh, there they are. Uh, and so gave hugs. We still did not communicate <laughs> because I was like, oh, where are you from? And they say, Valencia. And I'm like, oh, because we walked through Valencia and Tui. I Valencia and Tui. And she said, no, no, you know, Valencia. It's like, da, 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 da. <laughs> I was like, I have no idea what that means. So if anybody here knows what da, 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 da means, uh, let me know. Um, but they're from a place where that's common, I guess. But it was just a, a real sense of everything coming together. Um, roll to the next slide. We're done. Lost, being lost, being found. So sometimes when you think you're on the wrong road or you're walking the wrong direction, sometimes God uses that. And so uh, the Apollo, I looked this up. Jerry can confirm this too. Uh, the mission to the moon that the Apollo uh, uh, rockets took, for 97% of the time they were off course because they continued to course correct all the way until they got to the moon. So if any trajectory they stayed on, 97% of the time they would have been off course, which I think gives great comfort to us in terms of our life of following Jesus. Maybe 90% of the time we're off course, but we can be confident in this, that God continues to course correct. So there I am in front of the cathedral, final shots of our Zoom cohort. We met uh, just last week. All of us together, uh, great friendships. Some of them that are more local will be able to continue. Uh, that's us praying. That's us laughing. I did some screenshots carefully so I can catch pictures of them. And what I feel like is that we're probably not at the end uh, of all of this, but probably uh, journeys like this are always a new beginning. So a little longer than I wanted, but sorry about that. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And so, uh, yeah. That's it.